Good morning. Come on, good morning. Is it still raining outside or is the sun out? Oh, thank, praise Jesus. I swear, it's been raining and raining and raining so much. Uh, I forgot what sunshine looked like because the animals are walking two by two in our backyard. Um, we are in our Happily Ever After series. And although we are focusing on the marital relationships, these messages, this one in particular, apply to all relationships. So if you're not in a marital relationship, don't check out. You are going to be blessed and you'll hear some of the relevance um, of what we're talking about today that applies to all relationships, including our relationship with God, obviously. Now, let's recap where we have been. The first week we talked about, Daniel talked about one and one, W-O-N and O-N-E. Same but different. And the fact that God created us different, male and female, but the same in the image of himself. Then the following week, last week, he talked about this idea of it's worth it. Marriage is work, but it's worth it. And this Sunday, we are going to be talking about heads up, heads up, heads up. All right, someone almost made it to the uh, front of the line. Um, we're talking about heads up, you know, and when someone throws something at you, you know, you say, heads up, here it comes, Jeff. And so, you know, you kind of check to see what's happening. So heads up, we're going to discuss two threats, give you a heads up on two threats to uh, the marital relationship and all relationships in general. And before we kind of j- d- jump into that, I want to uh, ask you to pray for me as I pray for you. I don't want to get ahead of myself, which I just did. So let's pray real quick. Lord, I ask that uh, the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts are truly and absolutely uh, worthy of you. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would come and would uh, open our minds and our hearts in such a way that when we hear this message, your word, that uh, we leave here changed just a little bit more into, into your son and who you've called us to be. Lord, we love you. In your precious name, the people of God say, amen. So we're talking about relationships. So let me lay out some foundational stuff before we jump into these two threats, the heads up on these two threats to um, the, our, our marriages and our relationships with our spouse and with others. The first thing I want to just state, and I know you guys get this, but I just want to state this. We were built to be in relationship with others. I mean, we were built, we were designed to be in relationship because our God is a relational God. And we know this because of the doctrine of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Separate but together, living in this relationship. Um, the mystery of the Trinity. But from the love of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit from the Trinity, from the love of that relationship, because God is relational, overflows and invites us to be in relationship. I think Daniel talked about this a little bit the first week of the series, about how Adam and Eve were in the garden, and God walked with them. There was an unbroken relationship between God, Adam, and between God and Adam and Eve, and then between each other. When scripture says they were naked and unashamed, it's this beautiful reality of unbrokenness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his his, uh, book, Life Together, talks about the, the divine reality that this kingdom reality that we will be in unbroken relationship with God and with one another when we get to heaven. So Adam and Eve were created with unbroken relationship and the ability to break that relationship through sin, which they did. Now we live in a time where we have a broken relationship with God. Christ came to restore that broken relationship. We have the opportunity to restore that broken relationship through what Christ did by the power of the Holy Spirit to connect back to God the Father. And then when we get to heaven, we will have unbroken relationship again. And that unbroken relationship will be with God and with one another. And so... 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about, well, hey, listen, if it's, if it's going to happen in heaven, the Lord's prayer is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's start living out some of that unbroken relationship here. And there are threats to the marital relationship. And, this is, and there are threats to our relationship with God. And there are threats uh, to our relationship with our, our kids and our families and our, and, and our friends. And, and, and here is the premises about what we're going to be talking about uh, when we d- jump into uh, these two scriptures in Ephesians, we are either moving towards oneness, connectedness, particularly in our marriage. Because, you know, in scripture it says in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. We are either moving towards oneness, connectedness in our relationship with our spouse, in our relationships with others, in our relationship with our kids, in our relationship with God, or we are moving towards or drifting towards isolation. Get your mind around that. We're either moving towards connectedness, oneness. That's what God desires, particularly in a marital relationship. The two shall become one. You know, the reason why God took a rib was because he wanted to show in Scripture how we are connected yet separate when we come together as a spouse. The two shall become one because they came from one flesh, the flesh that God created, separate but different. Separate, that's the same thing. Separate but the same. And so think about what it looks like in terms of as we unpack these two threats uh, to a marital relationship, to our relationships with others, what does it look like for you to move towards connectedness, oneness, versus moving towards isolation? I'll give you a couple of uh, examples of what that looks like sometimes in our household, and you might relate to this. Everybody's got some kind of electronic gizmo in our house. And there are times when you can look around, and we can actually be in the same room watching something on Netflix completely different, and all four of us are in the same room. You know, we're kind of moving towards this isolation. At least I do sometimes when Netflix puts something out and it has like four, five, or eight, nine series, you know, or episodes. I'm like, I'll be in my room, I'm going to go through all of them, I'm just going to binge on Netflix right now. And so I move away, you know, from connectedness to isolation. And, you know, there are times when it's good to get away. This isn't about being an introvert or an extrovert, all right? Extroverts find their energy being around people, introverts find their energy, you know, being separated. That, that's, not, that's not isolation. We're, t- we're talking about something completely different, are we, and particularly with our spouses. Are we moving towards oneness? Or are we drifting towards isolation? Now, there are two threats that we're going to talk about that you find in Ephesians. And I believe uh, understanding what threatens our marital relationships will help us achieve a deeper connection and oneness with our spouse. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 27, this is the first threat. Heads up. Anger that leads you to sin. And I'm going to be using the message here um, because I like the way that it kind of unpacks us. And the message says, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. In other words, it's okay to get angry. Anger is something that, you know, takes place a lot of times in a lot of people's lives. It's okay to be angry. Just don't let it fuel you to sin. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. So you can get angry, but don't let it lead to sin. Now, I'll just confess. I had an episode this week, probably more than one, but I'm just going to confess the one, where I got angry and it kind of led to sin. Okay, my, our, our house flooded. I think I've told you the story about two months ago. Uh, the toilet overflowed for 12 hours straight. All four bedrooms, uh, the hallway, everything, half the house is completely, you know, ruined. We got those 
wood floors. They call them wood floors, but they're snap and click, you know, and so those things get wet. They get an ice cube on it, and they, you know, mess up. And, and so we have three of the four rooms done and the hallway. All we have left is the office. And I don't know if it's Friday or Saturday. We've got an air intake, you know, AC, and then my son's room's over here, my daughter's room's over here, and I go down, and I, for some reason, praise God, remove the air intakes underneath, and there's concrete down there, and I see water dripping from the air conditioner. And we've had some issues with this before, but, you know, it has a drain. It goes outside and all that kind of stuff. And it's, when you look deep, it's going underneath the, um, the, the bottom plates, the two-by-fours, which means it's going into their rooms underneath the new snap and click floors. And I freak with anger. Oh, my God, go get the shop back. Oh, we just got these in. I can't believe this. And I'm so angry. And, of course, everyone's like duck and cover. They're just getting away from the rage of, of dad. And, you know, and, 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 you know, we've all had those times when our anger has led to sin. Anybody been angry driving? And it led to sin. Only you know what you say when you're by yourself to that person in front of you that's a stranger. You never know. And you do it to other people, you cut them off too. And, um, but anger, that leads to sin. That's a threat. Heads up. I had a, a really good friend, a professor at, at, at Asbury where I went to a seminary. And we became really good friends. And he was sharing um, some, a story about, you know, how he went through his divorce. And... Um, he said, you know, Jay, uh, one of the things I didn't realize was um, for 25 years, they were married for a long time, um, when we got divorced, one of the things that still was, still had marred her, my wife, was my anger on our honeymoon night, or not night, but while they're on, while they're on their honeymoon, uh, she broke a coffee pot, and he got so angry. And I guess the way that he got angry with her, you know, never left uh, the back of her mind. And it was one of the things that led to um, their subsequent divorce 25 years ago. We have to be careful about what we say and what we do when we're angry. I had a, I had a high school buddy, his name was Mark Bischoff, and man, he used to get it was almost an art form how he would get angry. His dad was a big guy. His name was Big Al. And, and his dad would get angry, and so he just adopted that gene or whatever. And Mark would just go berserk with anger. You know, and sometimes there would be collateral damage around um, when Mark got angry. Our anger, if it leads to sin, can leave real long-term marks on others. Um, the second part of this is, is, and don't, you know, don't go to bed uh, still being angry. I had someone tell me, you know, make sure, you know, if you're arguing with your spouse, if you're getting, you know, some kind of, you know, heated, you know, if you're angry, don't go to bed without fixing that before you go to bed with your wife. Okay, so I tried to adopt that, and God made sure I did. And I haven't been perfect at it by any stretch, but it's almost comical sometimes and my wife doesn't really know this, but like, say we get in an argument and she's in the TV room and I go, you know, I'm going to bed. I'll get in my bedroom and I'll tell God, I am going to bed. I am not, I am right, she is wrong, I am going to bed. And God said, no, you're not. I go, yes, I am. Go, no, you're not. And I'm literally, I'm literally having that kind of teenage, adolescent conversation with God. And of course, what happens? I get up out of bed at some point, and, you know, sometimes I do it with a good heart. Sometimes I just do it, you know, just to be disciplined. I love you, honey. Good night. You know, is that, are you happy now? Can I go to bed, you know? I mean, I'm literally, God's got to be cracking up, you know, at, at, at a man who acts like a, a 12-year-old. And it was never me that got me up out of that bed. It was, it was God. And... It was some years later, I don't know, three or four years ago, my wife you know, gave me a compliment, and she said, um, I really like that you, when, we are, when we're fighting or we're, you're, we're angry, we have a discussion, that you come back and try to make it right. And I never thought she even cared about it. 
And I'm like, praise God, you know, okay, okay, you're right, you're right. I won't argue anymore with you, and I still do. But um, that we all have growing edges, and, but, but anger that leads to sin, heads up in your marriage, don't let the sun go down. If you're in a heated argument, if you're angry with one another, somebody just figure out a way to make it right before you go to bed. Because I love how scripture defines this in, um, with the message. Because you don't want to give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. The second threat to the marital relationship found in Ephesians and, and to relationships in general, and this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time, um, it comes from, uh, again, the message, and it's verse 29, verse, uh, chapter 4. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word a gift. Other scriptural interpretations will say, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. I've got to tell you, until I did this study for this message, I always understood that just in a general sense that uh, Paul was talking about, you know, don't cuss, don't say dirty words, don't say crude words, don't say, you don't use foul language, um, don't use, you know, don't say, you know, jokes that your mom wouldn't be proud of if she heard you say them. I always thought it was that kind of, of um, command, imperative, that Paul was talking about here. And then I looked up the word, the Greek word, we have nothing that comes even close to defining and unpacking what this word is. And it's, it's sapros. S-A-P-R-O-S. Now, if we were living in biblical times, we would get this because of the context. And so in kind of the secular writing of the day, um, the word sapros was used to convey the idea of smelly fish and rotting fruit. And, And so with that kind of word, that kind of understanding, Paul is saying, look, if it's unpleasant, if it's, you know, creating an, an atmosphere that is unpleasant, what do you do with smelly fish and rotten fruit and, you know, vegetables? When it creates that, uh, that smell, you throw it out. You don't even think. It's just instinctual. You just get rid of it. And Paul is using this understanding in terms of how we use our words. Are our words uplifting? Or are they sapros words? And I'm going to unpack this just a little bit because this really convicted me in a lot of ways. You know, as soon as, I think it was like Monday or Tuesday, I had dug into this. And so I, I go, well, I got to start living this out, you know, before I preach it. And so I'm, I go into, you know, where all the kids are and Lori is and the movie room. And all of a sudden, words that are sapros, unpleasant, you know, come out of my mouth. They don't have to be dirty words. And that's how I always understood this. They don't have to be cuss words. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be just gossip. It doesn't have to be, it can be any kind of, of words or communication that is not uplifting, that is not full of grace, that is not edifying, edifice building. It's not building up one another. Paul is saying, if you have those kinds of words, sapros words, throw them out. Discard them like you would rotten fish, that you would smelly and, you know, rotting vegetables. Get rid of them. Now, the original readers would understand that. And then this idea that is conveyed even further, you know, don't let those words come out of your mouth, that verb of the, the, ver- of the, of the words coming out, is they would understand like a bird taking flight and our thoughts taking flight never to be caged again. Our words are powerful. And so Paul is saying, don't use sapros words. Let me give you an example. We have a bunny invasion in our backyard. I'm telling you, if the world comes to an end, we can live on, I can hunt bunnies for a year and my family will eat well. Um, well, they'll eat. I don't know if you'd eat well. but um, they, And my kids... Last week, uh, my, my son said, hey, Dad, uh, be careful when you're mowing the lawn. Uh, there, I found a nest of rats. I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm hoping maybe the lawnmower will get them, you know, if we'll be done with this. And so I'm mowing the lawn. You don't want rats. Ugh. And so 
you know, I'm mowing the lawn and have a little bit of a hill next to the pool, you know, and I notice there's this white fluffy stuff there. And so I open it up and I can see why they thought they were rats. I mean, their eyes were closed, they were all scrunched up, but they were baby bunnies. Oh, I was so, I mean, like they were ugly then, but then about with like in a week, they were so cute. And they lived in this little hole and of course we had all this rain, right? And so they've just kind of grown and, um, and so my son goes out there after school and he just has this heart. He's like the dog whisperer of the animal. He just loves these, you know, uh, animals. And so um, he, after this really bad rain we had sometime during, you know, Wednesday or Thursday, or, uh, he, he said, Dad, they've all scattered. And the, and the little, you know, hole they had there was, you know, kind of muddy. And so he went to try to catch, get, get, get them all and put them back in the hole. And... Um, one jumped out of his hand and it died. And he's telling me this story. And I pause for a moment and I look at him and I go, bunny killer. <laughs> and he goes, why did you say that? And I'm like, because it's funny. How many times do we use that excuse, I'm just joking, to deliver something that isn't fully full of grace, that isn't edifying, that doesn't build up the one next to us? How often do we use, I'm just joking, I, I, I'm just sarcastic, and how that tears people down. Of course, I'm preaching on this, and I'm thinking to myself, why did I say that? So I get up, and I go, and I give my son a hug, and I said, you know, I know you didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I said, you know, and he actually gave me a strong one-handed hug, which is good at teenage years. At least it was one. It was strong, not like, you know, he just, and do you guys get, do you guys get what Paul's telling you? Do you get what Paul's telling you? Do you guys get what Paul is telling you? See, even our tone, even our tone can tear people down versus build them up. And when it comes to our spouses, the one that God has called us to do life together, to the two become one, you know, the leave your mother, your father to become one, don't we want to build them up? Because Paul is talking about how we use our words, and, and it's not limited just to our spouse. It's whoever we come in contact with, but, and particularly those in relationship, are our words thoughtful? Do we take time to try to build up the person that we're talking to? Are we careful about how we're using our words so that, so that they're full of grace, so that, they're, that, that we're coaching, so that we're building someone up, so that we're um, um, conveying grace and love? See, that's what Paul's talking about here. Not just bad words. And can you imagine what that begins to look like in your uh, and your significant relationships with your spouse, with your family members, with your sons, with your, with your parents, with people that you work with, with people that you're close with, with friends, with people just in the public square. When our words, when we begin to think about how we use our words and we just want them to build, we just want to build others up. I recently did a marriage um, with this incredible couple and I had their prepare um, uh, uh, questionnaire assessment, marriage assessment, and I saw two things about who they were, and God just said, focus on that. And so I, I began to just talk about these, these characteristic traits that each of them had. And like, you could just see them like get lifted up, their countenance, just the way that, 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 that they were responding. And, I, and that came from God that, that I was able to like see that clearly when I was talking with them. You know, imagine we do that all the time. Imagine we do that with one another here at church. I mean, if this became the culture, and by the way, this isn't easy to fix. We live in a hypercritical culture. We live in a culture that looks for the one thing negative out of a thousand things good. Case in point, your kid has seven classes, he comes home to school, and he's got six A's and one B. What do you focus on? The B. He makes six A's. 
If my parents had made a couple of days, they'd been excited about, you know, yeah, hey, he's way to go. I mean, we focus on the negative. Imagine our interactions with one another as a church. Our interactions when we have ideas that maybe others don't agree with or, 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 or see things moving in a different direction. Imagine, imagine us building one another up, not using Sapros words. I'm telling you, it's so counterculture. There would be a 10-mile radius where people would be flocking to get into church where that was part of the DNA of who the church is. And it starts with our spouse. It starts with our closest relationships. Are our words thoughtful? Do they build up? Is our tone uplifting? Do we hide critical and negative things in joking? I do. I'm the king of that. I come from a, a family of jokesters. Imagine what that would look like if you left here today and you ask God to put on your heart, who are some people that I could just build up? Maybe it's going to be in the car. Maybe it's going to be um, when you get home. Maybe it's going to be when you get to work. But imagine beginning to build that kind of worldview that when the stuff comes in, our minds and our hearts, the good words, the edifying words, the building up words, the gr- words full of grace come out and we begin to throw off Sapros words. Sapros words. Heads up. Two threats to our relationships with our spouse and with others. Anger that leads to sin and using Sapros words. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning and this word. I ask, Lord, that this word begin to permeate all of our hearts here. And Lord, when we go home, and we leave here, we have grown just a little bit more as your disciple because of our time here. Holy Spirit, please infect our hearts with your word. In your precious name, the people of God say, amen.